Welcome to the Makers and Mystics podcast. This is season six, episode one. It's a new season here on the podcast. May it be a new season in your creative journey as well. I'm thrilled about the wonderful conversations we have planned for this season, and also for the upcoming series of artist profiles, where we'll be introducing you to figures from history who will both inspire as well as challenge you to consider broader perspectives related to art, faith, and culture. You may have seen some of our posts on Instagram recently from the current live podcast events that we're hosting in select cities around the world. And as this Makers and Mystics tour continues, we'll be publishing excerpts from these events for you here on the show as well. We've had such a full summer hosting our first annual Bright Wings Poetry Contest, traveling to different cities, hosting our live events, and making plans for the 2020 Breath and Clay Gathering. But today on the show, I have the honor of starting season six off by highlighting the recent work of an artist you've heard here on the show before. Today we have singer-songwriter Josh Garrels with us. So get ready, friends. The best is yet to come, and you and I have only scratched the surface on this journey of art, faith, and culture. This is my conversation with singer-songwriter Josh Garrels. Josh, it's an honor to have you back with us on Makers and Mystics. I think the last time you were on the show, you were just starting to feel the stirring to move back from Portland to Indiana. And now you're settled in there in your new home, and you just released your album, Chrysaline, which I'm excited to talk with you about today. And I just had the chance to listen to the album in its entirety. And man, I am really loving the direction that you've taken your sound. And it's genuinely a beautiful work of art. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Well, tell me how long has this album been a work in process? Um, well, I started it last July. It was when I drove down to Charlottesville and tracked the kind of the bones of the album with Isaac Wardell and the team of people that he assembled. Uh, some of the songs were done. Some were just me singing gibberish. I had a chord structure and a melody. Um, spent a week there, then brought them back here to Indiana, where I continued to work on the songs for, you know, the next 10 months, um, you know, added four songs to it and just filled it out. You know, I, I did my Christmas album with Isaac and we were under such a tight time restraint on that because it had to be done like by September to be out by Christmas, you know, that this one I knew I wanted to work with Isaac again, but then have the freedom to treat albums the way that I have in the past where I really kind of get under the hood and um, labor over making sure it's all like working together well. And I knew I wanted to add synths and just other sample oriented content. You know, I, I just knew I wanted to t make this one a labor of love. So altogether, this one took me about a year. Well, you can really feel that labor of love in the songs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that definitely translates and one of the things that I recognized is that the music is a beautiful blend of some of the more familiar elements we've come to love about your music, but then there are also a lot of new elements in there as well. So I'd love to know some of what your creative thought process was behind the making of these songs, and what were some of the elements that informed this new direction for you? I think there are a few things that I think inform that. One going into a studio with other players who have different ways of playing instruments that I play, you know? So even a lot of the acoustic guitars in the album, they're not all me. I'd say maybe half is me, half is other people playing acoustic, you know? And everyone has their own touch on things, you know? And their own sort of specialties with instruments. So that's one thing, just different people's imprint on a song. I'm, I've grown to really appreciate that, um, getting other people's imprint on my music. But I think the other thing that would inform the sound is that these songs weren't written on the front end 
for others. They weren't necessary. I didn't have in mind, like, I'm going to make this big album, um, this kind of sacred music album, and these are the themes I want to hit, and these are the sounds that I want to play with. You know, these were songs written on, like, Sabbath days over the span of, like, a year, year and a half that I would just sit on a couch and plunk around, and these were, like, sort of heart songs, you know, a lot of them. Some of them, in the end, you know, I found a song, like, oh, this one would be nice to add to the mix, you know, as you realize you're building a record. But a lot of them started really tenderly, which I think is why those who followed my work for a while, even vocally, I'm, I'm singing pretty hushed. You know, even the songs that are a little more upbeat, I'm not necessarily belting out you know that's like a sort of a restrained album songs that i tried to sing out didn't feel right you know because i knew like i wrote these on a couch with an acoustic guitar and so i think that sort of informed sort of the more ambient ethereal qualities you know there are some instruments in there that i haven't used before but yeah i, th I think that's it even just the inception of the song was different i didn't set out to make uh, to like make an album on the front end of this so i think the songs I treated them a, a little differently, you know, even in like sort of building the soundscape, if you will, you know. Yeah, so I think both those things, a, a new set of players working with me and just how the songs were formed in the first place was from a different place. Um, so I think, yeah, that informed probably then how you choose to build the sound around it, you know. Well, you mentioned that some of these songs were written over Sabbath days and so I'm curious how much of your transition from Portland to Indiana may have played into the nature of these songs. Because when I think of Portland, I don't often think of Sabbath days. Yeah. But when I think of Indiana and the farmlands there, I could see how that may have impacted some of the writing. Yeah. Ironically, though, probably a lot of them were, were written in Portland, you know? Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> gotcha. I, yeah, some of them were here. But you're right, there is a, there is a difference. I, I am definitely impressed by my surroundings and i've realized even in being back here almost two years like the landscape here uh, wide open spaces it does something different to me you know it, it mm -hmm. i respond to it in a different way you know yeah um, so they do it does feel like these types of songs feel right coming from this place if nothing else you know it feels like this is the right place to be singing these songs well, there's a real devotional quality to this record. I think earlier you called it a collection of sacred songs. Yeah. And that's always been a thread running through your music, but it's really pronounced on this record in a tangible way, and I can really feel that Sabbath place in the songs. One thing I've noticed about this album that may be a little different from your previous albums is the amount of collaboration in the songs. For instance, Lauren Goins from The Lowland Hum makes an appearance, as well as Latifa Alatas, whom our listeners would remember from the episode with Moda Spira. And then, of course, Jason Barrows, who's been a longtime friend and bandmate of yours, he makes an appearance. Mm -hmm. And then also, I'm excited to let our listeners know that I was able to participate in this collaboration as well on the song Praise Him. Yeah, man. So tell me some about the collaborative nature of this record and what led you to involve others in this capacity. Well, first, this this is uh, one of the few albums that has a lot of songs that weren't written by me as well. I mean, even to add to the deeper level collaboration, you know, as the banner was written by Jason Barrows, Praise Him, you basically sent me... Man, what's the name of that African instrument? I always forget. I always want to call it something it's not what is it called ingoni it's the 12 string harp from west africa the ingoni yeah man so you sent me that track you know and we're like hey do you think you could do something with this and <laughs> I've, ne I've never actually written a song like that someone sending me sort of a formed structure 
and saying, hey, could you write something? And so that was something I'd never done, you know. Mm -hmm. The song Take Eat near the end, which is just basically the Lord's words saying, take eat, this is my body broken for your healing. This is my blood, you know. That was written by my dad when I was a little kid. We would take communion once a year, and we'd sing that song once a year when we took communion. And I decided I'm going to sing my dad. I'm going to sing my dad's song. Wow. Perfect Love was written by my buddy Wesley Randolph Eater, who just writes, I think, some of the best modern hymns out there, you know. Uh, what a Friend was written by my bandmate and longtime friend, Jay Kirkpatrick, and he wrote that 15 years ago. And I always liked it, you know. It's just one of those songs that I would find myself singing. And so some of these songs, they're just ones that I know friends and literally friends and family when you know, like, such a sweet little song. And then I don't think this is ever going to see the light of day if someone doesn't do something with it. You know, I like this song. I think others might like it too. So choosing even to, like, cover other people's work is something that I've not done a lot of in my life. But then beyond that, as we talked a little earlier, inviting other people to kind of put their signature on songs is something I've become more and more, um, it used to be I would just be comfortable with it, but I'm, I'm excited about it. I mean, I think someone who deserves a huge shout out is Tyler Chester. If you see him in the credits, this is the second time I've worked with him. And he's one of these guys when you you show him a song and every every musician has their own solution. How are we going to make this work? You know, how can we build this in the most effective way? And his gut instincts are amazing, man. And he'll take a song and he'll he'll ask you, but he sort of just says, let's restructure this. And he'll play it all differently. And you're like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> and it sounds better than it did when I played, you know, like restructuring things. That's new for me. Usually I have my song and people learn my song, but to like put something before others who are gifted in ways that I'm not gifted, that structure things differently than me and cut out the weak part. I mean, I think that's the beautiful part of collaboration when you can submit a thing to some people and they know their craft and are sensitive enough to see the potential in what you're submitting and not just be like, oh, this is awful, man. At least I hope that's not what they're thinking. <laughs> but see the potential in this thing that you, you're submitting and letting people manipulate these songs that I thought they were supposed to be one way, but they're gonna go another way. And then in the end realizing like, oh, they're a lot, they're a lot stronger. I wouldn't have thought of that. And I think that's, that's really the beauty of collaboration. Well, I want to ask you about one specific song on the album. Yeah. And it's the first song that I heard from this collection when you played it earlier this year at the Breath and the Clay Creative Arts Gathering. And this is the song Consecration. And when you played this song live, it quickly became one of my favorites of your songs. And now hearing the album version of it solidifies that thought for me even more. So I'd love to know some of the story behind this song, Consecration. Mm -hmm. So much of my storyline right now goes back to Portland, Oregon, and our final two years there, when we knew a change was coming. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. In Portland, on paper, our life looked really good, man. You know, we had this beautiful 100-year-old Foursquare. I built a studio in the backyard, had a great community, great church healthy kids, my music career's thriving. But inwardly, I was like withering, and I didn't know how to explain it. I was withering inside, and I didn't know why. And so that sort of crisis at that point reached the level that I got down on my hands and knees and said, I will walk away from music. I will do whatever you want me to do. And that's that's a intense place to be when you feel like life's, because everything's locked in and seems like it's all working so well and to be like I'll walk away from all this and that I feel like was the first time that word jumped out to me is like oh that's a thing that's what I'm doing right now I'm saying I'm yours do with me what you will you know what I mean because I feel like even my life as a believer up to that point in some ways maybe pridefully maybe naively it was like I know the Lord he's given me these he's given me these gifts and these talents and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna kill it and I'm gonna you know what I mean I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that and I'm like I have, the, I have the ability to do this. I have the funds to do this, you know, and it's kind of just moving and shaking, which isn't all bad. You know, I, I sensed him honor some of those steps, but there was definitely this point where he's like, bring me to the end of myself. You know what I mean? To where you're at a point where you say, 
I'll walk away from all of it, man. I don't really believe I have what I thought I had, and a real, kind of a healthy place of man. I, I just this is all cool, all the all this stuff, but man, I really want you. And if if to have more of you means I walk away from this, I'll walk away from this. And it was I I knew in the moment I was like, oh, this is real. This is how I actually feel. And so even I like, might scare super fans. Like I feel like my music career was on the knife's edge. If he'd have said walk that way, I would have walked that way. But he didn't. <laughs> he said, but he did say, I, I want like your music's gonna change though. The verses of my song Consecration are verbatim Francis Havergal's old hymn from like the 1800s. I think hers is just called Take My Life, Let It Be. You know, famous old hymn. And I would just read that one because it's, it was describing what I knew I was going through. This is what I want. Take my life, let it be consecrated to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow with ceaseless prayer. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless prayers. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips. And somehow I feel like putting sort of my life on the altar there. I mean, a lot of the changes in geography and the sound of my music, a lot of them like sprung from that moment. You know, consecration, that's that's our part of putting uh, putting ourselves sort of on the altar, if you will, which is why sort of the climax of the song is like, send your fire to the altar, Lord, take me. That's something that's in, in, in our power, is to like lay down what we have, our rights, our talents, our time, our money, our gifting, our family, our vocation. Like the, Those are things we offer to be set apart. And then his part is to answer and to like take what we've given and um, transform it which then that's the sanctification process. And he like sets it apart for holy uses, you know what I mean? Rather than common uses. And that's something we don't have, we don't have the power to just place ourselves there. All we have the power to do is say like, I'm willing to do whatever, I mean, you, you, I'll go, I'm here. You know, I'm, I'm laying it all down now. And these are things we sing and songs and, but it, we all know it's different when all of a sudden a thing becomes real to you. And you're like, this is where I'm at in my process right now. I'm ready to, I'm ready to lay it down. I think the storyline definitely continues from there. It wasn't like a zap and it's done moment. It's been this, again, like sort of transformational process, but I can chart it back to that time in Portland when everything seemed externally like perfect and internally was very disjointed and frustrating and withering. And it brought me to that point. Well, before we go, I want to ask you one more question. And this is about something you posted on your Instagram recently, because it really moved me personally when I read it. And I'd love to get you to elaborate on it. But you said that these songs were in part motivated by seeing a lot of your friends moving away from the faith. Or to quote you directly, you said, a quiet disassociation and distancing from the things pertaining to the faith. Hmm. Tell me how that experience impacted the nature of this record. Yeah, yeah. Well, first, I, I've realized, I think about it all the time lately, the sort of preacher in me is always kind of like cycling through the fact that like this is happening, you know, but it's not something that's, it's not an all of a sudden thing. I think it might be crescendoing sort of a, uh, a movement away from the faith in our generation mm -hmm. is sort of becoming more intense. But all the way back in 2011, when I made like Love and War and The Sea in Between was when I first started realizing like, oh, something's happening right now. You know, there's sort of a shaking going on. And in that album, it almost that album has like these sort of like epic qualities and warfare qualities. And this one was more like tender, you know, because I think in this one, 
as I said in that post, that started with a personal need of knowing, like, I need to draw near. Because as I've said to many before, like, none of us are unsusceptible or impervious to that trend, man. We can all become anchorless and find ourselves drifting and floating and not even realize that we've been drifting for weeks, months, years. So I think some that come out openly and kind of make a public declaration that, yeah, I don't believe this anymore. I know I wrote this book. I know I made these albums. I know I pastored this church. I know I've, I know I've done life with you for a decade or two, but I, I'm done, you know? Like that story is happening more and more. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's something that happens overnight either. I think it's a long, slow movement, you know? Right. It makes me wonder too. Those are just the ones that have sort of the zealous nature that wherever they're at, they feel the need to put it in the public sphere and be honest and say, this is where I'm at. Mm-hmm. In some ways, I appreciate that. They're calling a spade a spade, you know? It's like, this is where I'm at. I'm not going to pretend that I'm not here. In some ways, that's. Uh, Maybe the better way to go if if inwardly there's already sort of been a decision made. Sometimes I wonder how many are just going through the motions, if you will, because they don't want to upset their parents. They don't want to upset their spouse. Their huge portions of their social fabric are still people uh, in the faith. And so they know the drill. You know, mm-hmm. they can be around, but maybe not engage. We've all seen it. You can be around people without engaging. You can be roommates with a bunch of guys and never actually get to know them. Like, that's possible. So I think it's this thing that's been, I've seen it happening for the past almost decade, if you will. But it seems like it's becoming more intensified and it's becoming more of a trend that is on the upswing. And people close to me, really close to me, like walking away. And some, strangely, I think strangely to me, when, when those I know have walked away... Sort of like when someone finally gets a divorce or something. Sometimes the way that it's shared is nonchalant and maybe to everyone else who's close to that couple, like almost in poor taste, like you tweeted it? Like you announced this on Instagram? You know, because it's almost the thing itself has lost value to that person. So why are they going to go through some earnest, big hubbub about it? Because the marriage has lost its value. So of course it's like, yeah, we're done, guys. And the, it's often shared in a very nonchalant way, which I know that the people involved in that divorce, it hurts like hell, but I think uh, they're sort of done with it. And I know that those who are, have been like in my life, in the faith, share deep times. Then when the time comes that they like share, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm walking away. It's not, it's not emotional or anything, you know, to them. But it's interesting. Like, I've just realized as time goes on, this relationship with God is, it's a very sort of, primary um, vital vital part of who I am. And so it's not like I'm deeply offended. I, I, I guess I would say that. It's not a deep offense, but it's it's puzzling to me when something seems so so real and living and breathing and moving and it seems unsearchable to me. You know, I think the scripture that keeps coming to me is like it says in Ephesians, the unsearchable riches of Christ, the immeasurable greatness, the, you know, like mm-hmm. beyond all that we can ask or imagine. And I think in these past few years of pushing in a little more concertedly, it's almost like, as my friend and pastor in Portland would say, Josh White, the narrowness that so many people chafe against is actually the doorway into everything. And that when you go through the narrowness of Christ, which is to let go of all the other options in a society that loves options, you know, read some Wendell Mm -hmm. Berry. He has some great essays about endless options and what it's doing to us, you know? Yeah. And so in most of life right now, I feel like me and my wife feel this need to actually like limit our options. Moving back to Indiana in some ways was a move to... We would call it simplicity, but part of simplicity is limiting your options for the sake of the thing that you think has value. So when talking about the Lord, it's like he's becoming even more and more valuable to me, this um, person. Because God is like immeasurable greatness, like inexhaustible riches, you know, that are there to explore. And so, when yeah, when someone has seemingly tasted it and, and and then walked away is puzzling to me, is puzzling. I understand people in the world that have never been exposed. They've been exposed to caricatures and augmentations and lies about God. 
that they're like, I don't want anything to do with that. You know, I understand yeah. that. But once again, to pull back, I think what's tragic and serious and uh, it, intense to me is when someone seemingly has tasted. Yeah. Tasted and seen, and then then there's like, no thank you. Every mouth is like an open grave. No one searches for well it's really refreshing to hear your perspective on what's going on in our culture with so many people just abandoning the faith and even as you were talking about the unsearchable nature of god i know in my own journey of faith it's keeping my sense of wonder alive and engaging that never exhaustive always unfolding mystery and beauty that has kept me pressing forward even in the midst of my own difficulties and moments where it might seem more appealing just to drop out or easier just to just to drop out you know yep but when i listen to the songs on this record they call me back to that place of wonder and that place of being enthralled with the presence and so i just want to say thank you just for creating this work of art and thank you for sharing with us today on Makers and Mystics. Right on. Thanks for having me, Stephen. It's always so so nice to spend time with you. And thank you for listening to the Makers and Mystics podcast. We're grateful to this growing community of artists and seekers who are quickly becoming our family and friends. And I've reserved a special portion of my conversation with Josh just for you, our patrons. And you're not going to want to miss this part of the conversation. It's a segment where Josh relates the incredible experience that led him to name this album Chrysaline. So jump over to patreon.com slash makers and mystics. And if you haven't already, you can join our creative collective and access that part of the interview there. Or you can follow the link in the show notes to this episode. And before we go, I want to let you know we have several live podcast events happening this fall in select cities around the world. So be sure to check these out at makersandmystics.com and come and spend an evening with us. We're going to be in Denver, in Phoenix, New York City, in Durham, North Carolina, Frederick, Maryland. And in just a few days, I'm going to be hopping on a plane and headed over to Sydney, Australia. And you can keep up with my journeys as well as other things related to the podcast on our Instagram at Makers and Mystics. And if you've been impacted by this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes to help others find us as well. We'll be back next week with another artist profile. And in the meantime, keep creating. The world needs your art. Mm -hmm.